welcome to my sewing room. We have some of the most beautiful projects to share with you today and lots of wonderful techniques for you to learn right there at home also. The first precious project I would like to share with you is this beautiful pillow. This pillow has so many intricate and beautiful heirloom sewing types of things done on it. You can see at the top here's a piece of wide lace. Here's a piece of lace insertion, and this lace that has ribbons running through it is called beading. Then I love machine embroidery, and here is a beautiful machine embroidered uh, motif in the middle of this piece of batiste. And you know something? We have entredeau, very narrow puffing made on the machine, of course, uh, French insertion, Swiss beading, and another really pretty little row of uh, machine embroidery. And then if you look to see how this pillow is put together with buttons. It's just a tube with buttons, three buttons on either side and button holes and the little pillow in the middle. I just love that pillow and think it would be elegant in any room of my house and I bet it would be elegant in any room of your house also. This is one of the most interesting table runners that I have ever seen. It has the most magnificent scallops, or scallops, both are correct, either one you call them, scallops and scallops that run all the way around the edge. Isn't that pretty how they go in and out and in and out? But now the main feature I want you to look at on this table runner, there are two types of machine drawn work. Now you know drawn thread work takes eons to do by hand, but not so by machine. As a matter of fact, this project was taught at our school and the whole project was finished in one day. This type of drawn thread is called bundling. And then the drawn thread work, which you see further down on the table runner is just simply drawn thread work. It does not have the thread in the middle. Along with some wonderful wing needle stitches, it is absolutely fabulous. What a wonderful guest towel this is. It has the gimp work, machine embroidery, and the lace cathedral windows, and then just a little bit of machine embroidery below that. You talk about a pretty gift for a bride. And how about a gift for yourself, too? I love beautiful linens. This towel is also beautiful, made out of linen, with simply a little bit of machine embroidery. This has beading, a little machine embroidery, and then a purchased lace on the bottom. And you know what? If you have a bride in your family coming up, what a wonderful way for her to have a handkerchief to carry, to take linen and do a wonderful machine embroidery. And the little edging around this handkerchief looks like tatting, but it isn't. It's machine embroidery. And then put the bride's initials. Won't you come along with me over to the technique boards? And we're going to share with you just how easy it is to make really, really elegant linens. By showing you this magnificent tablecloth, I think you will see how beautiful drawn thread work is. Now, if I show you closely this beautiful drawn thread, you're probably going to think it took hundreds of hours to make. Well, it didn't because this is drawn thread work, which is done by machine. And we're going to show you in just a minute how easy it is to do. But isn't this a beautiful way to have elegant linens, elegant table linens, and really it doesn't take too terribly much time. Let me share with you exactly how this happens. First of all, you take linen fabric. You've got to be able to pull the threads on the linen. Then I pull the threads on the linen, leaving the little spaces there. Then very carefully, and I will not use orange thread, I will do a pin stitch right along one of those sides of the linen. And then I will do a pin stitch right along the other side of the linen. Now let me put this beautiful tablecloth back up here so you can get one more quick look at how elegant this is. And I'm going to introduce you to my guest today who made that beautiful tablecloth and who is going to share with you how to do uh, drawn thread by machine. I'm so happy to have as my guest Marlis Bennett. Marlis is a training consultant for Bernina of America. And Marlis, thank you so much oh, for coming to be on the show thank today. Thank you. It's so much fun to share these tips and tricks with your listeners and viewers. The very first thing, like you said, was make sure that you use your linen so that you can pull the threads. In my 
my tip is don't starch it first because the threads pull much easier when it's not starched. And your pull thread is going to be in a straight line anyway, so you don't have to worry about trying to keep everything straight. Marlis, do you wash the fabric before you pull the thread? I, it depends on the linen. Sometimes mm -hmm. I do. If it, if it feels like it has a lot of finish on it, then I will. If it doesn't, then I just I don't worry about that. Once the thread is pulled, you can see I've got an open area in here. Then I starch my fabric with some spray starch and press it very firmly because you'll get much neater results once you have your fabric starch when you begin to sew. And I do like to use an open toe embroidery foot so that I can actually see where I'm driving. And that's an important thing. So I'm going to set up my machine. I have a pin stitch selected and it's about a 2.5 width in length. What you want is you want in your stitching area, you want to have the back and forth motion in the drawn thread and then the pin coming off into the edge of the fabric. So let's just set this up and go. There we go. And you notice because the fabric has been starched, you can see that it bundles or pulls that thread together very, very nicely. If you have a little bit of problem and you're not getting the effect that you want, what you'll do then is you will come in and um, just adjust, adjust your length or maybe even play with the balance on your machine so that the stitches do come out very nicely. At the back of the machine, you can see how nice that has pulled together. Once you're very well, that's first, a regular needle you're using. Just a okay. regular okay. needle. Now you can use it with a very heavy needle. I like sometimes to uh, make the same effect of maybe using a wing needle, but I will use a really big top stitch needle, like a 120 top stitch needle, mm -hmm. will give you that same effect, and you don't have to worry about working with a wing needle. Once your side is pulled, then you have several options here, and one of them is that um, when it comes time to and do the second row, you can either come directly in between what you have already bundled and then you get more of a zigzag effect to your, your um, work, or you can do what I've done here. And this is the tip that I'd like to share with everybody today. If I want to make my, my bars very, very parallel, what I do is I take a tool like this, either an awl or one of these um, Shish kebab, kebab sticks, sticks. <laughs> and then come through and pull this oh. open and that way it creates holes that you can put your needle into it. It makes it so much easier to see, you know, and that I think is the whole key. So if I come in to do the second stitch, I'm going to place my fabric down and I like to use my hand wheel and get it going into the first hole and make sure I've got it over where I need to have it because you know that we got to get everything just right. And then this part does take a little bit of time because you do want to hit the, the holes that you've created with your stirrer stick. It just works so, so easy this way and we'll just, um, it's much easier than doing it by hand. Oh you know. my goodness, that's the understatement. Yeah. Marlis, that is fascinating. But and I loved you using the little shish kebab stick to make it open. You really can see a lot you better really that way. You really can see and know which holes to hit. This is just fascinating. Thank you so much, Thanks. Marlis. And now I have a quilt square to share with you. I love this blue danube quilt. I named it the blue danube quilt because it just was so beautiful it reminded me of a waltz and also it's blue. Now one of my favorite squares on this quilt is the shark's teeth square. Isn't this wonderful? It ha we have two rows of shark's teeth, two rows of three rows of shark's teeth and then there's a beautiful ecru and green machine embroidery on either side. Now, I have to tell you that shark's teeth has been one of the most beloved techniques that we've ever had in So Beautiful magazine. So many people love it. You can use it on women's clothes, on home decorating, on babies' clothes, on christening dresses, and it looks quite complicated, but I'll let you in on a little secret. It's very easy. Now, let me just prove that to you. First of all, you draw a template. I have my fold line my stitching line and these little points that connect are what the little points that are going to be cut eventually to make the shark's teeth. Now if you will look over here on this side I have folded on the fold line, stitched on the stitching line and I have made three tucks. 
as you can see, one, two, and they're nice and pressed, so I'm having a little trouble getting them up. Three tucks. Okay, let's go to the next step. I have to make shark's teeth out of these tucks. That is why we have these lines. Next, I'm going to fold these lines, get my scissors, and cut right almost, almost up to the stitching line. There's one cut, here's another cut, and then the fun begins. I'm going to fold these cuts, I'm going to fold it back, and I have to fold this little tuck in. Let me use my shish kebab stick here so I can get my hands out of the way. I fold this tuck back, finger press it, fold this tuck back, finger press it. Now let me show you something that's a lot easier than finger pressing. Okay, go back in there. It's a little bit easier if I take some glue stick. Now I didn't say hot glue gun. Just some glue stick and it makes it go much more easily if I put glue stick and I fold it back and it automatically sticks. And that is what makes it really easy to do. Now I've gone ahead and folded my tucks on this row right here and I'm going to show you one way you can stitch them. I've already have glue stick on them. I have my machine set on a pin stitch and a pin stitch and here we go. I'm going to sew <clears throat> where the outside of the pin stitch runs right along the stitching line where I made my tuck and the little fingers go over to grab the shark's teeth. Now this is where you lay it out flat. This is one way of stitching the shark's teeth. You can also turn it up and stitch it from the other side, which is not a problem if I want to see the shark's teeth a little bit better. Let me just show you that one right quick too. Stitching it from the other side. All I do is turn it over. I have to start from this end. All I do is turn it over if I want to see it a little bit more clearly. And some people like to stitch from the back just like this. And that's perfectly all right. It stitches beautifully either way, so the choice is yours. If you want to stitch where you're looking at your little shark's teeth, or if you want to stitch where you're looking at the finished part of the shark's teeth. And that is how easy it is to make those beautiful, beautiful uh, shark's teeth. And one of your real tricks is a little stick of glue stick. And now, won't you go get the kids, because we have some kids' embroidery just for your children. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today my dear friend and business colleague, Claudia Newton. Claudia is editorial director of the Fancy Works section of So Beautiful magazine. Claudia has studied at the Japanese School of Embroidery and at the Royal School of Needlework in London. Claudia, welcome to the show, and what do you have for our kids today? Thank you, Martha. Uh, we're going to learn how to write our name today. We're going to use a back stitch to do that with. And what I've done with mine is to put it on a little hand towel on a piece of ribbon. I've attached mine by hand with a blanket stitch, but you could also put it on with a sewing machine if you have an adult help you, or you could embroider it on something that doesn't require ribbon. The first thing I want to do is to show you how to make the back stitch. So let's get started on that now. What you want to do is, like we've talked about in the past, put your name on your piece that you're going to embroider. And you can see that I've got some dotted lines through here. Those are your placement lines because in the past we've had a template that you can just trace directly on. But if you're going to write your name, your letters will be different from somebody else's. So what you need to know is that you will choose the letters for your name, trace them onto a straight line like this dotted line, then see this center line. What you'll need to do is once you've traced your name, you need to fold it so that this end meets that end and it'll put a fold right down the middle of your name. That fold is what you want to place on that dotted line so that half your name is on one side and half your name is on the other side. Once you've done that, you'll trace it onto the ribbon just like you would normally trace a template and you're ready to stitch. Now back stitch is very easy. And the reason it's called back stitch is because we're going to take a stitch in front and then we're going to go backwards to complete that stitch. So if I want to take a back stitch on this piece of fabric, I would start here, not at the end of the line, but in front, because the front of the stitch comes first, and then I back up, go in at the back, 
to make my next stitch, I come up in front and then I go back. When you go into the back, you go back into the same hole or very close to it. I may have missed mine there, but you want to try to hit the same hole. Come up again in front, go down and back. I'm going to do two or three more here, just big ones, to get me down to the corner and show you how you turn a corner because it'll look a little funny to you the first couple of times you do a corner since you're accustomed to doing everything going frontwards and this time we're going a little bit backwards. To do the last one coming into the corner, you come up right at the corner point, go down, back in just like we always have. And for what we're learning to do today, just go a little bit forward on your next line, stitch back into that corner, come up ahead of it, and I missed the line a little bit, yours will be right on the line, stitch back into it. And that's all you need to know about making this back stitch. Now for the project that we have today, I want to show you one other thing. When you were embroider on ribbon, you saw that I had that back stitch in a hoop to work on it. If you put just a piece of ribbon in your hoop, it's going to be loose in here and it'll let it flop around and you can't work on it very well. So what I've done, this stuff that looks like plastic, it dissolves in water. It's called a water soluble stabilizer. And what happens is that if you put it in your hoop, just like a piece of fabric, then put the ribbon on top of it before you put the hoop together, it's just like stitching on a piece of fabric. And when I'm finished, you take it out, you trim away all of the extra plastic stabilizer here, rinse out the rest of it in water, and it all goes away so that you've got a piece of ribbon with your embroidery on it. And that's all that you have to do to stabilize this while you work on it. Now the other thing that I want you to see is, since we're working with a towel here, I've done this in two separate pieces. If I were to put the ribbon on first and try to work the embroidery, it's too bulky and those little bitty stitches won't work very well. So what you want to do is just what I told you, put the ribbon in a hoop with your stabilizer, embroider on the ribbon first, get it completely finished, and then stitch it to your towel after the embroidery has been done. And we've added little buttons to decorate it so it can be How embellished any way you want. Claudia, that would be such a wonderful to put those on all of your towels in your bathroom right. and then to make some for gifts too. Certainly. It'd be oh. cute for Mother's Day. Put mom on one. Fun for <laughs> our Father's Day too. Right. <laughs> and next I have a doll dress for you. This is one of the most beautiful doll dresses I have ever seen and has so many fabulous details. If any of you are sewing doll clothes for your porcelain dolls for competitions, this might be the dress for you. This dress is modeled by our Dress Me Mary doll. Now then, Mary with her dark hair looks so beautiful in this white dress. One of the first details we're going to talk about today are the folded, the folded tucks that come down the front in a V shape. Now, if I can get over here and pull this lace back, you'll be able to see another detail. The tucks, instead of running across, are running up and down on either side of that V-shape. What a beautiful detail. The sleeves have released tucks with entredeau and gathered lace, and the skirt has wonderful released tucks that come down about to this point, and then go on down to see the bottom of the skirt. The beautiful miters and the pretty gathered lace, and you know something she even has a slip that's just as pretty as her dress. Okay, folded tucks are on the order for today. This is a strip of folded tucks, which is really very pretty, and that's the basis of the front of this dress. Now, how do you make a folded tuck? I draw tuck lines, and don't do them in, in blue ink, but I have to do that so you can see them here. Then I fold on the fold lines, and I am using an edge stitching foot and I simply have a straight stitch and I can go as fast as I want to. It's wonderful to have the edge stitching foot because I have something to guide it to right here in the front as you can see. I can guide these tucks and make wonderful folded tucks and make them straight every single time. And that's all there is to making folded tucks. So I make a folded tuck strip. Then for the bodice of the doll dress, I trace off, using the pattern, I trace off the V shape. I'm going to take Swiss Entredeau, put it right down on the V shape on this side, and I'll come around here and do the same thing on the other side, cut a piece on the other side, 
Then I will stitch down the V-shaped entredeau on the outside only. And then, straight stitching it, I will trim away the rest of the tucks. Now the tucks, as you know, were going this way when I first stitched them down. I'm going to turn the tucks this way, and then I will turn and I will do uh, entredeau, entredeau to flat fabric. I will stitch the tucks on, and then my tucks will go, uh-oh, upside down, I'm sorry, and then my tucks will go up and down rather than sideways. After the tuck section has been attached, and now it's sort of in a V shape, I'm going to put the lace that goes up and down each side of the entredeau. I have gathered the lace using the string that is built into the gathering, and I will simply put the gathered lace down, and I will zigzag it. Now, I told you about that string that was built in. Let me show you how you gather French lace. It's really very easy. French laces have three or four gathering threads built right into the lace. The one that makes a scallop on the top is the easiest one to pull out. So I pull it up and then I simply slip the gathers along and the gathering thread is actually built into the French laces. I don't think any other laces uh, have that gathering thread built into them. But I just use French laces on my heirloom clothes so it's never a problem for me to have a gathering thread built in. After you gather it, then you lay it down and you zigzag it right on top to the lace. And now won't you come along to my attic with me? I never shall forget the day I bought this dress in Sydney, Australia. I thought it was the most beautiful antique dress I had ever seen. Later on on that trip, Joanna and Joe flew down and we did a photo shoot and I had Joanna wear this dress with the Sydney Opera House in the background for a picture for So Beautiful magazine. I want you just to look at the lace work on the bodice of this dress. It has lace shaping, tucks, Swiss embroidered pieces, all different kinds of lace. Before we go too far down on the dress, I really would like for you to see this magnificent sleeve. It has, once again, lace shaping. It has beautiful Swiss embroideries. It has all different types of lace. And then down on the sleeve area, there are tucks. I believe those are one, two, three, four, five, six pin tucks. Isn't that a wonderful cuff? Now, to let you see this skirt a little bit better, I'm just going to pick it up. I think that's just the prettiest skirt I think I ever saw. Let me hold it up and show you that there's a ruffle on the top. And then I think there's another ruffle on the, on the, yeah, there's another ruffle. And then the bottom of the skirt is just plain fabric. That would be something to be very beautiful to do today. I think this would make a really pretty wedding dress myself. Now then, I have a wonderful letter to share with you. Um, this is from Linda Zergot. It says, my daughter-in-law worked for a fabric company in New York, and they handled a fabric line for one of the major designers. There were often scraps of a yard or so or sample pieces sent to furniture designers that were discarded. The company began sending some of them to me. <clears throat> a friend and I set up workshops with friends. We finished 53 quilts for the group homes for the mentally challenged. They were so appreciative and could not believe that someone would make a quilt, especially for them. Some of them wrote us thank you notes that we will treasure always. We have since made more quilts and given them to a kidney dialysis center. It is probably the most rewarding thing that we have ever done. We definitely are believers that what you do for others will come back so many more times greater to you. The letter is from Sue Gillamet and Linda Zergot. They are from Northwest Indiana and nearby South Chicago suburb. Linda and Sue, thank you so very much for sharing this. And you're right, it gives you so much more pleasure than you can ever imagine when you do something for others. Thank you so much for coming to my sewing room today. I'd like to invite you back next time.